Rock Chat with Trace. This podcast I'm talking to Mark Kelly, whose 30 plus year career has included being the keys for Marillion. And today he's here to talk about his first ever solo album, Mark Kelly Marathon. Hello Mark and thank you for doing the podcast. Hello. Why did you choose to play the keyboards? It's probably when I first heard Rick Wakeman playing with Yes, sort of early to mid 70s. Well, it's probably mid 70s actually. I was about I think I was quite late to start playing the keyboards. I was 15 and my elder brother, Mike, um, had the, the Yes triple live album, Yes songs. And um, that was my first introduction to progressive rock music, I think. And uh, that was sort of what's got me interested in keyboards. And then from there, I, um, I managed to persuade my mum to buy me an organ very shortly after that joined the band. I must have been terrible because I've probably only been playing for about three months, but um, it was a bug and I just caught it and carried on from there. Can you explain your equipment? Well, most of my stuff these days is virtual instruments, what they call VST instruments. Uh, So it's all in computer, really. Um, I use um, keyboard, the actual keyboards I use, the the MIDI controllers as they are. Um, There's a, there's a, a Roland RD2000, which is a weighted piano type keyboard. And then on top of that, I have a, um, a Korg Karma, which it's getting quite old now, but I, I like the sound of it. And then there's um, another keyboard controller from Native Instruments, which I have on the right hand side. And then on the left hand side, there's a, a Nord. I can't remember what the, the, the model number is, but it's basically an organ, which I use for quite a lot of the organ sounds that I play. Um, that's pretty much it. I've got a mini Moog from the old days that I still occasionally use for things, but I don't tend to take it on the road much. What two albums have been the most influential for you? Well, probably the, the one I mentioned earlier, the, the, the Yes album, um, Yes Songs, was probably the, the most influential album because it got me started on keyboards. And, and I'm still, I, I still like listening to Yes occasionally these days. So, But probably um, the Pink Floyd albums from the 70s as well, you know, Dark Side of the Moon, Wish You Were Here and Animals, I suppose. Um, but I'm not, you know, I'm not big on keyboard player albums, really. I tend to, you know, the... the 70s progressive rock, you know, yes, Genesis, Pink Floyd. And then more more recently, bands like Elbow and Radiohead. And um, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I check out what's going on in the sort of progressive music scene. It's not much that I've heard this year that I really like. There's a, there's a band called Arabs in Aspect that, I, that they've got an album they brought out this year, which is pretty good. How has the prog scene changed over the years? I would say that um, through, by the late 70s, by 77, um, prog was considered dead and we were all dinosaurs or they were all dinosaurs because I was only just getting started but you know when punk came along I think it, it, it was pretty much consigned to the dustbin as far as most people were concerned and and then Marillion happened in the early 80s and and um, but you know we we tried to sort of take some of the influences of what was happening at the time the sort of you know the new wave and the punk stuff and you know so our music was more aggressive and and the, the lyrics were more rooted in real real life than the, the lyrics of people like John Anderson or Peter Gabriel or whatever. So, um, yeah, we weren't singing about hobbits and, and fairies, you know. But then I think there was like a sort of revival of progressive rock, mainly from, from the, the success that Marillion had in the early 80s, I think, um, by, you know, there was a lot of progressive, well, not a lot, there were some progressive bands around still, we were one of them, uh, but I think when when EMI saw the potential for for Marillion, they also signed up Palace, and then there was IQ and Pendragon and Twelfth Night. There was a lot of bands that were sort of contemporaries of ours that seemed to um, get a lot more interest because of the success that Marillion were having. Um, but I think that all sort of pretty much died away, and I think throughout the eighties, progressive rock was still pretty unfashionable, certainly for the mainstream music press. Um, but then something strange happened. I think it's probably when Radiohead made the OK Computer around about 97, um, people started to think it was somehow progressive and, and there was some comparisons made between what Radiohead were doing and, 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 and progressive music. And then I think there's a lot of, a lot of people started to admit that they, that they listened to Pink Floyd or Genesis or people that were popular and, and trendy. Um, you know, I'm thinking people like Noel Gallagher and, you know, so just, just unlikely people sort of closet 
prog fans were starting to speak up and say, actually, yeah, they grew up listening to this stuff and they liked it. And I think a progressive music towards the late 90s, early 2000s became sort of rehabilitated and, and almost um, okay to admit that you liked it again, you know? And, and, and I certainly, I think that's what we found with Marillion. We went from being, you know, ignored or disliked by, by the media to suddenly, actually, no, that we were, we were respected again. And, and, the, and then we did the whole crowdfunding thing and we're, you know, credited with inventing modern day crowdfunding. Um, and that got us some, some respect. So I think nowadays, I think, you know, progressive, I mean, Prog Magazine's been going for like 10 years or so. There's a good progressive rock music audience. There's a, there's a lot of crossover between prog and metal. So you've got the whole prog metal thing. And, you know, um, so there's a, there's a really, I, I would say, a, a thriving prog scene at the moment, um, which is really healthy, which is great. Why have you decided to do a solo album now? A few things. One friend of mine, um, his name's Guy Vickers, he, he, um, he came to me and said that he's been writing some lyrics. Well, he'd, he'd been writing lyrics for years, but he suggested that maybe we could collaborate and he could write some lyrics for me if I was to do a solo album. And I was I, I sort of, I suppose, half interested, but not, you know, I've never really been that enthusiastic about doing a solo album, even though I've been talking about it and for a number of years at different times. I did, so frankly, I got fed up with people asking me, when are you going to do a solo album? Because I first mentioned it back in 95 or 96. So Guy said, well, I, I could write some, some lyrics for you. And I gave him some music to work with. And he sort of stuck a few of these musical passages that I'd given him together with, with some lyrics. And that was, became the song Amelia, which is the opening track on the album. Uh, and then I, um, but it was, it was just me. So I, I invited my nephew to see if he could do some guitar and bass and, and add a drum track to it because he's used to making music on his own. He's, he's 23, but he's, he's always worked alone doing his own productions and stuff. So, so he sort of developed it a bit further, you know, made it sound like a band demo, you know, uh, even though it was just him and me. And then a bit later on, well, actually much later on, once I'd sort of got rough demos for the songs, I found Ollie, the singer, that um, he, he, he was recommended to me. So basically what happened was I did an interview with, with the web magazine, which is our sort of fanzine. And um, they, they were asking me about whether I was working on a solo album. And I said, well, yeah, I'm looking for a singer though. I said, I've been trawling through all these unknown bands on, on Spotify, you know, seeing if I can find somebody that I like the sound of that I could invite to sing on the album. So, and then one day I came across this, this band um, that they'd, they'd only had a few thousand streams. So I knew they weren't well known. Um, called Big Blue Ball and and I listened to this track and I was like wow this guy's really good he's amazing I'm like thinking this is the guy I'm thinking God, he sounds remarkably like Peter Gabriel and then of course I did a bit of research and found out it actually was Peter Gabriel um, <laughs> it turned out that this Big Blue Ball project was something that he, he did many years ago and it had just been released but it really had a few thousand listeners it was completely unknown but it's I mean if you check now it's still only got less than 200,000 um, streams which is not a lot for Spotify but anyway a friend of mine read this article about my misadventures looking for a singer and, and mistakenly thinking that, that, that I could get Peter Gabriel to do it and he called me up and said I've got just the guy for you if, if you want somebody that sounds like Peter Gabriel so and that's how I found Ollie so he's, he does have a Gabriel-esh quality to his voice but I think he's also got a bit a bit like Guy Garvey the singer from Elbow so but then once Ollie was on board um, it looked like we were getting to the stage where we're going to go just do what bands normally do, go in the studio and, and, and record an album, you know. I had two, two guitar players, but then lockdown happened and we were making the Marillion. We just started work on the next Marillion album. Um, and um, so we decided to stop going to the studio, and, you know, stay at home like everybody was advised to do. And it was that point I thought, okay, we're stuck at home for a few months. Why don't I? So I, I asked the rest of the guys, how do you fancy trying to record an album at home? Um, drummer friend of mine, Henry Rogers, I worked with back in 2012 on an album by a band called The Exodus. And I knew Henry had his own studio, so it's, it was straightforward for him to record the drums in, in his studio at home, send me the parts, and then I'd get the guitar players to record and Ollie to record his parts and Connell to do his parts and everybody sent them to me and I stuck it all together. And then, so that's really why it happened this year rather than, because it probably wouldn't have happened this year, but hadn't it for, for us being stuck at home for three or four months, 
I probably would have been working on the next Marillion album and not had time to do it. So I've got something to be grateful for. This year hasn't been all bad for me, even though I know it's been pretty terrible for a lot of people. What does Oliver bring to the band? Well, he's, he's, the quality of his voice is excellent. He's, he's very good at coming up with, with vocal melodies. I never make suggestions for vocal melodies. I literally send him music and words, and it's up to him to figure out where to make, sing those words, how to make them fit. And you know, he does his own vocal production, really, because he'll, he'll literally sing the parts and harmonies and, and mix the whole thing and with, with effects as well. So, so he, he's very much, um, he takes care of the whole vocal department. Connell's did some vocals as well, some, some of the backing, uh, backing vocal parts, but, but definitely Ollie's, um, he's, he's very good at, I, mean, I think he's, he's, his choice of melodies is also very instant as well, in the sense that you hear them once and, and they stick in your head. It's like he's, he's got a good ear for a, for a hook, you know, which I think in, in progressive rock music is not a bad thing because you, if you've got these long episodic pieces of music that don't repeat very much, but, um, it's good to have stuff that hooks you in, you know, and, and he's great at coming up with vocal melodies that, that are memorable. So I think it works really well. How would you describe Marathon Sound? Well, it's hard for me to, I, I can hear obviously that there's some aspects of Marillion there because of my involvement. Um, a few people have likened it to the sort of Mike and the Mechanics approach being that some of the songs are quite you know, commercial sounding, for want of a better word, like this time, it's very straightforward. I would call it pop rock rather than progressive rock. So there's that aspect to it. Um, I'm purposely trying to make it a little bit retro sounding, more, you know, going back to the earlier days of progressive rock. I think it's got, um, it's not overly complicated, although some of the songs are long. I've, I, you know, I'm not into, you know, just loads of weird time signatures and, you know, thousands of notes to the bar, just, you know, you know, the sort of, and I'm certainly not a big fan of the sort of jazz side of things either. So I'm pretty straightforward in my approach. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it, it, it's accessible prog. That's what I would call it. Why did you choose Amelia as a first single? Because I think it represents the album. I think in fact, I think if the obvious choice would be to say go with this time because it's a short song it's more like a single but i didn't think it was representative of the of the album as a whole i think so, a song like this time would do a job in trying you know we're trying to get some radio play with it which we may or may not get but i think it's more suitable for radio you know normal radio rather than you know the sort of specialist progressive rock shows and of which there aren't many um so i suppose amelia gives you more of an idea of what you would get if you bought the album, whereas I don't think this time, or, or When I Fell is the other rock choice, which is a, sh a shorter song. Like, again, it's, it's um, you know, it's a nice song. I really like how it turned out. But I think for me, the three songs that, that, that represent the, the album style, if you like, would be Puppets, Amelia and 2051. So, and that makes up the bulk of the music. So there you go. Can you explain 2051? Um, the lyric is about, um, well, it's sort of a, a, a mashup of two, two sort of themes, really. One is the, the story of 2001 and the, um, the relationship between Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke. So they came together with the idea of making a, a film with Clarke writing the screenplay and Kubrick making the movie. And Clarke was going to make a book out of it as well, a novel, which, which was going to be published at the same time. But the, the movie ran over budget and over time, and Arthur C. Clarke was, was getting short of money, and there was a lot of disagreements between the two of them, you know, two, two shall I say, geniuses working in separate fields, you know, different art forms, but somehow trying to work together. And was a, So it was about the communication between them and their, you know, how that went but then there's another theme in this in the the so the reason i called it 2051 was because um the guy who wrote the lyric who originally called it turn it down and that was a reference to stephen hawkins warning that we may be attracting unwanted attention by broadcasting into outer space and we may you know we may not like what happens if if we actually, if our call is answered, you know, so he suggested that we stop doing that because it might not go well for humanity if, if we were visited by a superior 
race. They might not have their best intentions at heart, you know. And it's a bit like the what happened to the Native Americans when when the white settlers first arrived in North America. You know, when two civilizations meet, the more advanced one tends to wipe out the less advanced one. So that was the sort of part of the theme. And then, so, but, but I was going to call it 2021, you know, sort of as a reference to 2001, you know, because it was 2001, 2010 was the, the sequel. And then, so I thought, okay, 2021. But then this was back in 2016 or 2017. But, and I was going to start to worry that the album wouldn't get made before 2021 and then it would be out of date so that's why at the last minute when ollie was singing the vocal i said have you sung that bit yet at the end of 21 he said no i'm just about to do it i said well can you change it to 2051 because i think 2021 is a bit close now and and i was also concerned that i didn't want people to think it was about covid you know because of the there's some reference to viruses in the in the um, in the lyrics as well, and it's nothing to do with that. So that was a way of distancing it from now and what's going on now. So the idea that humanity is being, you know, not wiped out but certainly um, attacked by a virus. Um, so that's pretty much what it's about. Um, Can you explain how puppets differ from 2051? I think musically they're, they're very closely related. Um, you know, they're very, you know, they've got a similar from a similar musical style, I suppose. Lyrically, Puppets is about free will. That's basically what that lyric's about. But yeah, it was, um, I think Puppets for me is, is the sort of the most um, retro sounding song out of all of them really. And I think, you know, using Mellotrons in the, in the verses and stuff and it was, was to try and get that sort of mood really. Will you be releasing any more singles? Probably not, no. I think um, that's pretty much it because the album's out in a few weeks. So um, there's, there's no, there's no, you know, the idea of singles really is that, you know, we don't really have singles these days. I think it's more of a, a sort of a lead track off the album, something to get people interested, something that you can push to, to try and, you know, get people to, to be interested in, in hearing more, you know. Um, so with between Amelia and this time, I think there's enough. If people are going to be interested by after hearing one or both of those, then there's probably not much point in trying to get them interested in any of the others. Is this a one album project? No, not at all. Um, we actually wrote another three songs, which didn't, well, I say didn't make it on the album. They, they wouldn't fit on the album. I always wanted it to be a vinyl release as well as a CD. And so it had to be 45 minutes or less so it could fit on a normal vinyl record. And, so the, these five songs I chose were the ones that for me worked best together as a as an album. But the other three, two of them are fairly pretty much finished, and the other one's not quite finished. But they'll be on the next one, and it probably won't be too much longer before we. There's a there's going to be one really long track on the next one, and these are and probably these other three, and that'll be it. So um, so you know I'm already working on it, so it shouldn't be. It, it'll be in the next year or so. Explain to me about running with Marathon. Okay, that was a, one of the girls at the record company came up with that idea. Um, as you know, I'm, well, you may, maybe you don't know, but I, I like running. And, uh, and they said, well, we've called the band Marathon and you like running. Why don't we do some sort of, we can have a little contest around running and see if we can get people interested in, in, in doing that. I was a bit concerned that it might not appeal to everybody because I know most people don't like to go running long distances. But as we made it, anybody it's just a bit of fun really it's just a way of keeping people engaged and updating people with with um what's going on so it's not necessary for people to join in with the running um or the walking or the cycling but if they want to that's great why do you think that we're really in the stay together for so long basically because we all get on well together um we've learned to live with each other's personality traits shall we say um <laughs> you know it'll be 40 years for me next year I think there's a there's a number of reasons we don't fight about money because we split everything equally we don't you know with the music we we've all got other outlets for things that we want to do that aren't brilliant and if we do fall out we've we've we're sort of old enough mature enough now to be able to say sorry and make up you know and i think we you know we work well together as a group you know we, we share enough in common musically that we're able to to continue working together and it feels pretty creative you know even after all these years we still enjoy working together so that's that's it really we i mean we've had a great great few years i mean this year's obviously has been pretty bad for music in general um certainly for touring anyway but 
you know, the last few years from 2016 onwards, we did the, the Royal Albert Hall three times in the last few years and, and those nice tours with nice venues. And um, so it feels like Marillion's back on the way up rather than at the end of our career, you know, we're, we're, um, we're having a little renaissance here, you know, which is great. Marillion has a new concert film with Friends of St. David's, which is out now. Can you explain the concept? Well, it's just a, a, a film of that concert at St. David's in Cardiff. And, um, you know, we, 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 we've often filmed the Port Zealand Meridian weekends and we decided with this, and we did film the Royal Albert Hall, but this tour that we did with the friends from the orchestra, there was a lot more material that we, you know, with the Royal Albert Hall, we only did like five or six songs with the, with the, with the extra players. And this tour that we did most recently back in the back end about a year ago now, you know, features a lot more songs with them. And we just, we, we knew before the tour, we, it would be nice to capture one of the shows on film just to have as a, you know, a keepsake from that tour because it's not something we're going to repeat really. Or if we do, it won't be very often. Um, and we chose Cardiff just because it's, we, we thought it would be a good venue to do it. It doesn't have the, the pressure of playing in the Royal Albert Hall. And to be honest, they charge a fortune to film in the Royal Albert Hall. Just for the privilege of, of setting a camera up there, it's like 20,000, 30,000 pounds, you know, they, like a facility fee, they call it. We, we chose Cardiff and that's, so that's pretty much what it is. Hopefully, I think it looks great. I think people will like it. There's, and there's some behind the scenes footage and, and stuff that, we, you know, must be rehearsing in Liverpool. And I think it gives a good document of that time and that tour. That's all. There's rumours of a new album coming next year. Is there anything you can say? I can say that we're well on the way to putting the songs together. I mean, we do a lot of jamming, and actually we've now reached a point where literally this week Mike Hunter said, look, we, we, we're going to have to stop the jamming and start to, you know, we've, we've already started putting some of the ideas together, but we're actually, this in, in the next few days, we're going to be listening back to what we've got and take stock and say, okay, out of these, these are the best 30 ideas. Um, let's narrow it down to 15. And those 15 are the ones we're going to take forward in and, and, and make an album from. Now, not all of them will, will get to the finish line, but you know, it's, they're sort of, they're recognizable as songs rather than just jams, but they're not finished, if you know what I mean. So it's, it's coming together nicely, I think. If it all goes smoothly, we'll be, we'll be well into recording in the early part next year and we'll have an album finished by the summer. That's my prediction. I'm not going to make any promises, but because um, I did, I predicted that Donald Trump wouldn't stay as president of the United States for four years. I put, I put a hundred pound bet on it actually and, and I lost. So my predictions aren't good, you know. Did you know how big misplaced childhood would become? Of course not. No, we 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 didn't um, we didn't even think that we were going to have a. Nobody predicted the success of Kaylee, you know, um, which is the reason why Miss Post Child was such a big album at the end of the day. You know, so that's the thing about singles. Coming back to that, that the the publicity you get surrounding a, a big hit record is enough to get people interested. And even though Kaylee is a representative of of Marillion as a whole. It's the reason why we're here talking now, because I don't think Marillion would have been able to continue for all those years without a hit like Kaylee. So, you know, I'm thankful that, that happened, but nobody could predict it. I mean, it, I remember when we finished recording the album, we played it to somebody in the record, when we were in Berlin, we played it to somebody from the record company, whose job was to decide what was going to be the single. And, and he listened through the album and said, have you got anything else? So he was, it was not like he went, oh yeah, Kaylee, that's the one that's going to be monster. Nobody. Nobody saw it coming, really. But it seems obvious now that it was the most logical choice. But he liked the idea of putting out Lady Nina as a single, so there you go. You created internet crowdfunding for Marillion's Anchorachnophobia album. How did you come up with the idea? Well, it was sort of, I was inspired by the fact that a few years earlier, we had done a tour of the United States um, funded by the fans. It was sort of like, um, it wasn't crowdfunding as people understand it now, but then it was sort of the forerunner, I suppose, because it was like a, it was more like a charity thing, really, because I was on a, like a, it's not like a chat room, but you know, like a, like a mailing list where you can, you send an email to the list, it then gets put into a digest and is sent out to all the people that are on the list. And there was probably a thousand people on this list, which was like fans of Meridian and the list was called the Freaks mailing list. And it was mainly people in America. Um, and I was on that list and people were speculating about whether or not Meridian would tour. 
in the States. And I went online and said it was unlikely because we didn't have a record contract in the States. And usually the record company would be putting money up to help fund the tour because it was not possible for us to make money touring the States because we didn't play to enough people. And the cost of getting there and all the rest of it was was quite a, quite a lot. One of the fans suggested that they raise the money and they said, oh, how much, you know, how much do you need? And I, I sort of took a guess and said, $60,000, you know, like it was, it varied. It was a, I can remember one tour, we lost about $120,000 and another tour, it might be $50,000. We never make money in the States. These days it's a bit different, but back then it was, you know, it was just so expensive to tour. Anyway, this fan said, well, I can open a bank account and people can make donations. And then, you know, when, when we've raised the money, you can do the tour. I'm like, yeah, okay, sounds a bit crazy, but why not? <laughs> and, then, and then within a few weeks, they'd raised eighteen thousand dollars. At that point, I hadn't even told the band. You know, I was like, so I eventually I went to the band and I said, guys, well, we might be doing a tour of the states in the summer because um, these fans are these crazy fans are all putting money into a bank account to pay us to tour. So that was in 1997, and we did do the tour, and they did raise the money. But then a few years later, when we were without a record deal in, you know, our, our deal with the independent label we were signed to was a three album deal. So we did the three albums, which was The Strange Engine, Radiation and Dot Com. And we were without a deal, wondering what to do next. We were being offered similar sorts of deals by other by men and other people. And we didn't really want to sign another deal like that. And that was when I said, well, why don't we ask the fans? So that was how it came about, really. And everybody was a bit unsure about the idea. Nobody had tried it before. And I said, we can ask them to buy the album in advance. And, and then when, the, when we've made it, we'll send it to them. And it seems simple and, and you know, obvious now. And lots of people have done it. Um, but back then, we were the first. And, but I think it's, you have to appreciate that it's because of the, the fans' willingness to trust us and support us and their enthusiasm for, for Marine and... and and what we do that um, that made it happen really made it even possible for us to think about it because I think it's I don't think you know there's not not every band can could do that or ask that of their fans so uh, so it was a it, was, it felt like an idea whose time had come you know it wouldn't it wouldn't have been possible without the internet and the internet was just at that stage really getting going you know most people by then had I say most people surprisingly a lot of people didn't have email. We only had, I think it was like 6,000 people on our email mailing list at the time. You know, it was the early days for all that, but, um, but yeah, it was good. How did working with Travis come about? That was through a friend of mine um, and Adam Wakeman. Um, I've known Adam a number of years and, and um, the, the son of Rick, um, and he, he was playing with Travis as their keyboard player. Because they don't really have a keyboard player in the band, but when they tour, they take a keyboard player with them. And um, and Adam was their keyboard player. But he'd been off, he had been he was actually working with Ozzy Osbourne. Travis, I, I think what happened was, Travis weren't planning to tour, which is why Adam wasn't busy with them. And um, Morrissey canceled the Isle of Wight Festival. Travis were asked to step in, take over. And then, the, the, they, so they agreed to do that, and then they thought, okay, well, we need to. So then they booked themselves for Tea in the Park, and there's a few other festivals. And they thought, once they're going out, they might as well do a few more. But then they needed the keyboard player, and that was when I got suggested by Adam. Actually, my friend Phil, who's also friends with Adam, said, to Adam, what about Mark? Why don't we ask him? And then they managed to phone me up. Ian McAndrew is his name, and he phoned me and asked me if I would be up for playing keyboards uh, in on these festivals in a few weeks time. And I'm like, I don't know, uh, how long have I got to decide? And he said, 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm like, okay, give me a minute. I phoned Adam and I said, how hard is it? What's the, cause I don't really know the songs that well. You know, I, I can, I knew a few of the hits, but I said, is it a difficult gig? He goes, no, it's easy. Don't worry. Just say yes. So I phoned that in the country back. I said, yeah, right, I'll do it. And then, and then I popped around to Adam's house and he quickly talked me through the parts and, and that was it. So. Can you explain the Featured Artist Coalition? Uh, I'm not involved in that anymore these days, uh, but it's a, 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 an organisation that was set up. I was one of the founders of it. Um, but uh, it's basically just to try and um, it's a, to have a voice for people like us, really. Um, I think, you know, the Musicians' Union 
I suppose, is the closest thing to the Featured Artists Coalition. Isn't it? But Musicians' Unions, we felt, was focused more on session players and orchestra players rather than people like us, you know. That was why the FAC was set up. And um, it's still it's still going and they're still doing good stuff. Um, you know, it's basically trying to get a fair deal for, for artists, you know. Mark Kelly's album Marathon came out on the 27th of November 2020 and I'd like to thank Mark for coming on Rock Chat with Trace.